Welcome to The Whole Steward, the holistic approach to wealth from a Christian worldview. I'm your host, Andrew Stanton, and I'm glad you've joined. Today, this is a special report on the banking system and the bank failures as a whole. I brought you last week that Silicon Valley Bank has failed, and there are certain new developments to be paying attention to since last week's recording. I bring you the latest today on The Whole Steward. Well, this is episode number 12, and I've titled it When the Bank Fails Part 2 because there are critical updates that I want to bring you that I couldn't just leave on the table because there are certain things that I said last week that are not actually true because there are new developments that have come out since I did that recording. First is that there have been several press releases that have revealed new information that is different from what I was saying was the case on Saturday when I recorded last week's episode. And I wanted to go over those nuances today. The other is that there are additional banks having trouble. One of those is the First Republic Bank. They saw an injection or a loan from 11 of the other larger banks to keep them afloat. So there is trouble in the banking system. And so let's see what is the response that's happening right now from the government. So let's look at those press releases from the FDIC. And I'm saying the Federal Reserve as well and the Treasury because they all seem to be in cahoots. And that's the thing that is very interesting to me. So there is... A press release on Sunday, March 12th, 2023. It's on the FDIC.gov website, Washington, D.C. Quote, the following statement was released by Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen, Federal Reserve Board Chair Jerome Powell, and FDIC Chairman Martin Grunberg. Today, we are taking decisive actions to protect the U.S. economy by strengthening public confidence in our banking system. This step will ensure that the U.S. banking system continues to perform its vital roles of protecting deposits and providing access to credit to households and businesses in a manner that promotes strong and sustainable economic growth. After receiving a recommendation from the boards of the FDIC and the Federal Reserve and consulting with the president, Secretary Yellen approved actions enabling the FDIC to complete its resolution of Silicon Valley Bank, Santa Clara, California, in a manner that fully protects all depositors. Depositors will have access to all their money starting Monday, March 13th. No losses associated with the resolution of Silicon Valley Bank will be borne by the taxpayer. End quote. So this is very interesting because... What they're saying is specifically depositors are going to be protected, fully protected. And I said last week that the FDIC insurance goes up to $250,000 and depositors that had more than that in the bank would be at risk. However, you can see that the government and these institutions are swooping in and saying, well, actually, we're going to go beyond that limit and we're going to insure all. All depositors get their full deposits back. It's interesting here that it says, quote, We are also announcing a similar systemic risk exception for Signature Bank New York, New York, which was closed today by its state chartering authority. All depositors of this institution will be made whole. As with the resolution of Silicon Valley Bank, no losses will be borne by the taxpayer. End quote. For just a second here, they're very careful to say no losses will be borne by the taxpayer. It's very interesting to me. Continuing on, quote, shareholders and certain unsecured debt holders will not be protected. Senior management has also been removed. Any losses to the deposit insurance fund to support uninsured depositors will be recovered by a special assessment on banks as required by law. Finally, 
The Federal Reserve Board on Sunday announced it will make available additional funding to eligible depository institutions to help assure banks have the ability to meet the needs of all their depositors. The U.S. banking system remains resilient and on solid foundation in large part due to reforms that were made after the financial crisis that ensured better safeguards for the banking industry. Those reforms combined with today's actions demonstrate our commitment to make the necessary steps to ensure that depositors' savings remain safe. End quote. So it's very interesting, as George Gammon says, the Federal Reserve and these government institutions always come out and say, oh, we have the tools in the toolbox to address these issues. And then they go and they make a new tool to address this new issue. Apparently, that is created by the Federal Reserve raising interest rates. Now, there are banks failing, and somehow the Federal Reserve is involved. And I'm not clear yet, but we'll get there, on how the Federal Reserve is involved or the Treasury. But they're very careful to say that taxpayers will not bear this burden. So let's look at the next press release, which came out a day later, March 13th on Monday, they say, quote, FDIC acts to protect all depositors of the former Silicon Valley Bank, Santa Clara, California. There's a lot of repeat in here, but I want to just go over one little thing, which is, quote, Silicon Valley Bank was closed by the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation on Friday, March 10th, 2023, and the FDIC was appointed receiver. The transfer of all deposits was completed under the systemic risk exception approved yesterday. All depositors of the institution will be made whole. No losses associated with the resolution of Silicon Valley Bank will be borne by taxpayers. Shareholders and certain unsecured debt holders will not be protected. Senior management has also been removed. Any losses to the deposit insurance fund to support uninsured depositors will be recovered by a special assessment on banks as required by law, end quote. So what I find interesting here is that they're saying the taxpayers will not bear this, but apparently it seems like the Federal Reserve is involved somehow in maybe temporarily loaning money to the uh, Silicon Valley Bank to get it through this liquidity crisis, or the FDIC is actually taking it over, and supposedly the insurance premiums to the FDIC is what covers Silicon Valley Bank's takeover, basically. But they're saying here, any losses to the deposit insurance fund to support uninsured depositors, remember that's anything above the $250,000 limit, will be recovered by a special assessment on banks as required by law. Okay, so they're going to assess fees on banks. It's going to be a special assessment. So don't the people end up paying for this anyways? I think that's how it's going to work. I'm not sure. If somebody who knows more about this wants to reach out, I mean, we're all here to learn, and so I would love to hear your perspective on it. But it appears that, you know, the banks will have a special assessment on them, and, and those fees will cover this. Uh, but at the end of the day, the customers pay for it, or if the banks really fail, you know, the Federal Reserve, which is the top banks, national banks in the U.S., can just create currency whenever they want to. They're never going to fail. All of this stems from this bigger problem of what's called fractional reserve banking. So when you take $100 and put it in the bank, the bank doesn't keep that full $100 sitting in a safe somewhere so that when you come back and you want it back, they can just hand it to you. The bank, with a little bit of reserves, will loan out most of that money to somebody else. So let's say they take they keep 10% on reserve. They loan $90 
out to maybe startup companies or people who buy uh, vehicles or houses or other types of credit. And let's say you're the guy who is getting a loan for your vehicle. Well, then you take that $90 that was loaned to you and you go and purchase a vehicle. Now, the company who sold you the vehicle takes that $90 and deposits it at the bank. Now, the bank says, oh, I got a deposit for $90. Well, they're not going to just sit on it. They're going to loan 90% of that out. So they're going to loan 80 some dollars out to somebody else who's going to, say, buy a house with it. And that money goes and gets deposited. And you can see how this cycle, the money is deposited and borrowed, deposited and borrowed, deposited and borrowed. And it's fractional reserve banking because your deposit at the bank is a liability to them because they owe you that money. But when they make a loan to somebody else, that's an asset to them because it's an investment that they're getting paid interest from. Say it's a car loan or a, or a mortgage. So now you have all these assets and liabilities string together. You know, your deposit is seen as an asset on your balance sheet, but it's a liability on the banks. Their loan to somebody else is an asset to them, but it's a liability to somebody else. And you can see fractional reserve banking strings this all the way out. So there's all these different deposits and loans being made in the banking system. And what happens if that original depositor who put the $100 in comes to the bank and says, hey, I gave you my cash and uh, I want it back now. I want the $100 back. Well, that's a big problem because, you know, there was only a fraction of that money on reserve at the bank. So now they could only, they really only have $10 on hand and they can't give you the whole $100 back. And so it's, it's really kind of a fragile system and it's just a domino effect all the way down if this falls apart. So what these government institutions are doing now is they're coming in and they're saying, hey, we can't uh, let this fail. You know, they're, they're trying to boost the confidence of the people in this system and saying, well, you know, we're going to just inject cash, as much cash as we need for the bank to meet that original guy's request of wanting his $100 back, right? And so they're saying, well, we're going to make you whole on the whole $100. So the FDIC comes in, takes over Silicon Valley Bank. So it's like basically the socializing of the banking system. Rather than just saying free market capitalism, let it fail, the, the government comes in and says, no, no, we got to hold the whole system together. Now, depending on your perspective, that may or may not be a good thing because now it's, it's kind of like socializing medicine or socializing you know, the financial system or socializing all these different, the, the education system, all these different things. Do you want the government in charge of this? It doesn't usually work out well for the people in the end. Now, I got super curious about the history of the FDIC. So when we come back, we're going to look at the speech that President Franklin D. Roosevelt made in 1933, March 12, 1933, when there was a banking crisis back then, and see what he says. I think you'll find it very fascinating. That'll be next on The Whole Stewart. Hey there, it's Andrew. I pour a lot into The Whole Steward, and I'm so humbled you're listening. Did you know I regularly post new articles to our website? I also send the Holistic Approach to Wealth newsletter once a week, to which you can subscribe at thewholesteward.com slash newsletter. If you're enjoying what you're hearing on the show, would you share it with a friend or leave us a review? I'd really appreciate it. Oh, and thanks for listening. So let's jump in here, and I want to show you a little bit of the history of the FDIC. On the website, on the About page, FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation 
is an independent agency created by Congress to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. I want to just ask you, is the FDIC succeeding to maintain stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system? Are they succeeding at that? I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of questions like where is all this money coming from and what are the effects of it? But regardless, they're at least trying to service whoever you know they, they want to make happy at any given time. So now apparently with this crisis, it's the depositors that they want to make happy. Back in 2008, uh, it was the the banks and the shareholders and the financial institutions themselves that were bailed out. Now it's the de- the depositors being bailed out. Isn't that fascinating? You know what I find interesting here is that it's it's an independent agency of the federal government. The FDIC was created in 1933 in response to the thousands of bank failures that occurred in the 1920s and early 1930s. The FDIC receives no congressional appropriations. It is funded by premiums that banks and savings associations pay for deposit insurance coverage. The FDIC insures trillions of dollars of deposits in U.S. banks and thrifts, deposits in virtually every bank and savings association in the country. Now, my question here is, how in the world can they insure trillions of dollars of deposits? Uh, Do they have that money sitting around? Like, are the premiums that the banks and savings associations pay for, for insurance coverage, are they covering all of this money that the FDIC says that it's able to cover? I don't understand how that could possibly be true. If you know the answer to that, please reach out. My guess is that the Federal Reserve will back them up. And that's why we see in these press releases that they seem, all three of them seem to be in cahoots with each other, the Department of the Treasury, the Federal Reserve, and the FDIC. It's all big money. It's all funny money. And somehow they're saying, well, we'll just, uh, we'll just backstop the system when it springs leaks. Apparently, there were thousands of bank failures that occurred in the 1920s and early 30s. Hmm, does that ring a bell? Yeah, I think it does. The Great Depression? Yes. Moving on. You can listen to the speech that President Franklin D. Roosevelt was speaking to the nation regarding the banking crisis on March 12, 1933. I'll play parts of it here today. Take a listen. My friends, I want to talk for a few minutes with the people of the United States about banking. To talk with the comparatively few who understand the mechanics of banking but more particularly with the overwhelming majority of you who use banks for the making of deposits and the drawing of checks. I want to tell you what has been done in the last few days and why it was done and what the next steps are going to be. I recognize that the many proclamations from state capitals and from Washington, the legislation, the treasury regulations and so forth, couched for the most part in banking and legal terms, ought to be explained for the benefit of the average citizen. I owe this in particular because of the fortitude and the good temper which everybody has, with which everybody has accepted the inconvenience and the hardships of the banking holiday. And I know that when you understand what we in Washington have been about, I shall continue to have your cooperation as fully as I have had your sympathy and your help during the past week. First of all, let me state the simple fact that when you deposit money in a bank, the bank does not put the money into a safe deposit vault. It invests your money in many different forms of credit, in bonds, in commercial paper, in mortgages, and in many other kinds of loans. In other words, the bank puts your money to work to keep the wheels of industry and of agriculture turning round. A comparatively small part of the money that you put into the bank is kept in currency, 
an amount which in normal times is wholly sufficient to cover the cash needs of the average citizen. In other words, the total amount of all the currency in the country is only a comparatively small proportion of the total deposits in all the banks of the country. What then happened during the last few days of February and the first few days of March? Because of undermined confidence on the part of the public, there was a general rush by a large portion of our population to turn bank deposits into currency or gold. A rush so great that the soundest banks couldn't get enough currency to meet the demand. The reason for this was that on the spur of the moment, it was of course impossible to sell perfectly sound assets of a bank and convert them into cash except at panic prices far below their real value. By the afternoon of March 3rd, a week ago last Friday, scarcely a bank in the country was open to do business. Proclamations closing them in whole or in part had been issued by the governors in almost all of the states. It was then that I issued the proclamation providing for the national bank holiday. And this was the first step in the government's reconstruction of our financial and economic fabric. The second step, last Thursday, was the legislation promptly and patriotically passed by the Congress, confirming my proclamation and broadening my powers so that it became possible in view of the requirement of time to extend the holiday and lift the ban of that holiday gradually in the days to come. This law also gave authority to develop a program of rehabilitation of our banking facilities. And I want to tell our citizens in every part of the nation that the National Congress, Republicans and Democrats alike, showed by this action a devotion to public welfare and a realization of the emergency and the necessity for speed that it is difficult to match in all our history. The third stage has been the series of regulations permitting the banks to continue their functions to take care of the distribution of food and household necessities and the payment of payrolls. This bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. Remember that no sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors last week. Neither is any bank which may turn out not to be in a position for immediate opening. The new law allows the 12 Federal Reserve Banks to issue additional currency on good assets and thus the banks that reopen will be able to meet every legitimate call. The new currency is being sent out by the Bureau of Engraving and Printing in large volume to every part of the country. It is sound currency because it is backed by actual good assets. So I think it's interesting in here. History repeats itself, doesn't it? Uh, they say that it repeats itself. It doesn't actually repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And it's almost like he could have been describing this exact situation. So all this legislation, all the measures that they put in place to create stability, apparently the same thing can still happen. And the FDIC steps in and has to inject liquidity into a bank to meet the depositors requests and demands for their money when there's a run on the bank. This has happened before, and they created this system. It's going to happen again, I would imagine, because history rhymes. He says in here, this bank holiday, while resulting in many cases in great inconvenience, is affording us the opportunity to supply the currency necessary to meet the situation. No sound bank is a dollar worse off than it was when it closed its doors on Monday. So, you know, what he's saying here is that, look, the, the assets that are on the bank's balance sheet are still, quote-unquote, still good. They just don't have the cash 
to hand you when you want your, your money back. The problem is right now what we're seeing is that the bonds that the bank has, the long-term bonds that the interest rates went up short-term, those long-term bonds that had very low interest rates, that means very high prices, they're not able to sell those except at a loss. So what the government is doing now, this is today, 2023, they're saying, hey, we'll allow you to borrow money based on those assets face value, not the value today if you were to sell them today, but we'll let you borrow money on their face value when they reach maturity. Does that make sense? So if it's, say it's a $100 bond, well, when it's mature, after 30 years, it would be worth $100, but today it's not worth that at all. And what what the government, what the Federal Reserve is saying is like, hey, we'll loan you money based on that $100 value that's sometime in the future, which is the face value, and let you borrow that money today to meet the demands. Let's get a little more from FDR, and then we'll wrap it up. I know that many people are worrying about state banks that are not members of the Federal Reserve System. There is no occasion for that worry. These banks can and will receive assistance from member banks and from the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And of course, they are under the immediate control of the state banking authorities. These state banks are following the same course as the national banks except that they get their licenses to resume business from the state authorities. And these authorities have been asked by the Secretary of the Treasury to permit their good banks to open up on the same schedule as the national banks. And so I am confident that the state banking departments will be as careful as the national government in the policy relating to the opening of banks and will follow the same broad theories. It is possible that when the banks resume, a very few people who have not recovered from their fear may again begin withdrawals. Let me make it clear to you that the banks will take care of all needs, except, of course, the hysterical demands of hoarders. And it is my belief that hoarding during the past week has become an exceedingly unfashionable pastime in every part of our nation. It needs no profit to tell you that when the people find that they can get their money, that they can get it when they want it for all legitimate purposes, the phantom of fear will soon be laid. People will again be glad to have their money where it will be safely taken care of and where they can use it conveniently at any time. I can assure you, my friends, that it is safer to keep your money in a reopened bank than it is to keep it under the mattress. The success of our whole national program depends, of course, on the cooperation of the public, on its intelligent support, and its use of a reliable system. <clears throat> Remember that the essential accomplishment of the new legislation is that it makes it possible for banks more readily to convert their assets into cash than was the case before. More liberal provision has been made for banks to borrow on these assets at the reserve banks, and more liberal pro provision has also been made for issuing currency on the security of these good assets. This currency is not fiat currency. It is issued only on adequate security, and every good bank has an abundance of such security. One more point before I close. There will be, of course, some banks unable to reopen without being reorganized. The new law allows the government to assist in making these reorganizations quickly and effectively, and even allows the government to subscribe to at least a part of any new capital that may be required. I hope you can see, my friends, from this essential recital of what your government is doing, uh, is doing, that there is nothing complex, nothing radical in the process. It's just the simple socialization of the banking system, the financial system, and we're basically making more liberal provision for the banks to borrow 
against their assets. We're also making more liberal provision for the issuing of currency on the security of those good assets. Back then, the currency was not a fiat or fiat currency, as he says, because it was backed by precious metals at that point. But we know today that it is a fiat currency, and they love to treat it as so. The value of the currency is always being manipulated by the central planners and outside forces in the national and global economy. But he reassures the American people that what they're doing is nothing complex or radical in the process. So don't worry, everything will be okay. I'd be remiss if I didn't let him finish it up. We're skipping a little bit, but let him finish it up on a positive note. After all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system more important than currency, more important than gold, and that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in banishing fear. We have provided the machinery to restore our financial system, and it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, your problem no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. So there's FDR solving the banking crisis of the 1930s for the American people. And you can see all the similarities and a lot of things that haven't changed. It may be arguably not any better today, if not worse. This, this whole system is just riddled with debt all over the place. And this is why I say, even if you want to do everything in cash, you can't get away from the effects of the debt-based system. It's all about loaning and borrowing all this money. And if you didn't listen to the lenders and debtors, it just comes right back to that. So anyways, there's a little piece of history for you, and those are the updates for today. Even though I don't understand all the mechanics, is somehow saying, hey, we're just going to insure all the depositors no matter what. And apparently it's the shareholders and the unsecured debt holders that will not be protected. And apparently the senior management of the bank also wasn't protected. They were removed. Um, don't worry, the government's got it under control. They're going to put people in place who actually know what they're doing. They won't have this problem ever happen again. And don't worry, the financial system is all completely stable and fine. And that's what they want you to know. You and I know that that's probably not exactly the case. You cannot just create more currency constantly. And I'm not saying necessarily that that precise thing is happening here, that they're printing money to solve this problem. Um, they're apparently going to recover this money by assessing fees on the banks. But at the end of the day, that doesn't help the economy. It doesn't help the situation of out-of-control debt and what is causing these issues, the, the fundamental problems that we're dealing with. So it doesn't really solve that problem. And so now, at the end of the day, it's going to lead to more printing, more borrowing, more kicking of the can down the road. Let's just look at the national debt really quick and see what it's at. The national debt is $31.46 trillion. This is the total amount of outstanding borrowing by the U.S. federal government accumulated over the nation's history. That is a lot of debt. How long can this last, folks? I don't know, but in reality, what you need to focus on is real assets. Remember, the whole steward has the nine buckets. Financial assets is only one bucket. If you can convert some of those things into real assets that you can use either in your business to create income or to retain the value that you have created, that you're managing. Those are ways that you can preserve your wealth. For example, if you buy a gold coin, as we talked about before, the gold of that coin pretty much is as useful yesterday as it was today. So you didn't 
really lose any value. You didn't really gain any value. It's still just a gold coin. But with this fiat currency or fiat currency, as Roosevelt apparently calls it, anything can happen. The dollar is still strong compared to other currencies because of the global oil trade agreement. But it does not mean that everything is super stable. So own real assets that can pay you every month. Create income streams. That is one way to navigate this. And also don't be fearful. Whatever happens, do not be fearful. Because God is in control, is he not? And we know that as Christians. We know God is in control. And we certainly have a lot of wealth to go around. So let's pray about it. Let's be mindful and wise and savvy. But let's not worry. Let's not worry about it. I just want to give you those little updates and corrections. And just one one last little tidbit on this. George Gammon, if, if you don't know who he is uh, and you like to really get in the weeds on this stuff, uh, he's got a great channel, uh, The Rebel Capitalist Show. He made a very interesting point that you've heard of central bank digital currency. That is sort of like a Bitcoin, but the central bank's version of Bitcoin. And I would like to do a whole show on this. In fact, I I probably will in the future. But they have been planning for a while now. And and I can show you the clips and you you can listen to the high up ranking officials like the chairman of the Federal Reserve and the the Saudi Arabian Fund and the European Monetary Fund, they were all talking about central bank digital currency and saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if we could have this central bank digital currency because then we could enforce policy through economics, right? You don't just need a policeman on the corner to catch you doing something wrong or arrest you or put you in jail. If you're not doing what the central planners want, for example you're not complying with all of their policies, they can hit you with basically the equivalent of monetary sanctions. Like your central bank digital currency won't work. Maybe you drove too many miles and you're damaging the climate and so you get a mileage quota in your car. Or maybe you need to wear a mask when they tell you and they and if you don't your bank digital currency central bank digital currency card doesn't work anymore uh they can enforce a lot of different things through the monetary system so be watching for that it's it's not a good thing that i can see when it falls into the hands of nefarious people and we all know there's no corruption in the government so as long as they're in charge everything will be okay right we'll see where this leads But if they're just saying, hey, we're going to just insure all depositors, well, why not just have your deposits at the Federal Reserve banks then? And they'll just create currency whenever they want. They can can create it and destroy it whenever they want, and they have full control over the system, and then they could have full control over transactions as well. So be watching for that. I hope you found this interesting, helpful, and engaging. If you have any questions, please send them to me, letters at thewholesteward.com. Also, if you know more than I do, please also contact me. I want to learn. That's why I'm here. I'm here to learn alongside you. I would appreciate hearing from you. I really would. So send me an email, letters at thewholesteward.com. Next week, I really hope to cover the energy of the economy. It is vitally important, very relevant as well. Uh, I think what I have prepared for that will still be fresh next week. So I look forward to that. You can subscribe easily through the website at the top. There's a subscribe button. It'll take you to the page. Subscribe on your favorite platform. We're on all the different uh, platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Podbean, YouTube, all these different places. So go ahead and subscribe so that you don't miss any of the episodes. I look forward to next week on The Whole Steward. Now that you know more, Go out and grow more.
All content on The Whole Steward is for informational purposes only and must not be considered personal, professional, tax, or legal advice. Please consult an appropriate professional for individualized advice. Though we do our best to bring you reliable information, we make no guarantee on its accuracy, so you must rely on your own due diligence to draw your own conclusions. The views expressed by guests on the show are their own and may not represent that of the host. Please visit our website for complete terms and conditions. Thanks for joining us today for The Holistic Approach to Wealth from a Christian Worldview. This show is brought to you by thewholesteward.com.